Sweet. Thanks, uh, Christina, again for uh, joining me today. Uh, do you want to start off by just speaking for a minute about who you are? Yeah, uh, for sure. So my name is Chris. I'm currently a senior at Duke, and I'm double majoring in statistics and French. Uh, I'm mostly in involved in a lot of venture-related things on campus, and so I'm a partner at Dormer Fund. Dormer Fund essentially is a uh, student-run VC, and so I got involved in that through a few other things on campus related to entrepreneurship. Uh, Duke is a pretty nascent hub for entrepreneurship, but we still have a, a booming ecosystem, and uh, yeah. Awesome, and uh, you've been at Dorm Room Fund, I think, for about a year right now, is, is that mm -hmm. correct? Yeah, I joined cool. uh, cool. junior fall, yeah. Sweet. And uh, I saw that you posted on your LinkedIn that like applications are open right now. Uh, can you talk more about that application process? I saw like the written application uh, in the link, but uh, can you talk more about maybe like the interview process or what happens after you submit that first application? Yeah. So essentially a dorm friend right now, from a high level overview, we're doing a like national recruitment search for our new investment partners. We do this once a year. Essentially it's for continuity of our teams. And so all of our teams are composed of student uh, partners at either undergraduate or graduate level. It doesn't matter what school you go to, just on the four regional teams. And so because we're recruiting for new partners, we're in the midst of a search until September 29th uh, to identify the best talent that's either interested in BC or interested in building stuff. And so you first submit an application that says like, uh, what, who's in your network? Um, who do you know who is, would be a really good founder or like if they already built something uh, it asks about what you're interested in as in like an industry you're interested in maybe like a specific sub vertical the industry trends um, maybe the company you find interesting and then just be more like short form questions afterwards we on our four investing investing teams uh, we review those and decide to do a first round interview for someone basically asking them about everything they talked about in their application uh, and specifically industry trends, as well as like their theses around student founders, around uh, sub verticals that they're interested in. We have a second round interview and then eventually we have a super day. And so super day is where multiple people from one of the Zormer Fund teams will interview you as well as our general partner, Molly Fowler. She interviews someone and then that whole process takes about two weeks and then someone becomes an investment partner. Cool. And then uh, we'd love to hear more about, uh, I guess, just like what happens when you get into Dorm Room Fund. Is there some sort of like onboarding process where they train you on what they're looking for in student founders or what I guess happens when you when you actually get in? Yeah, so there's onboarding. Uh, onboarding is a little bit like training, but not so formalized. Essentially, mm -hmm. uh, people are shadowing people who are current partners and learning all the ropes of how to talk to founders, how to, you know, go about our investment process. Once you do all that training, shadow someone and kind of get the general like VC basics, uh, you become a full-fledged investment partner yourself. And so you're in charge of your own deal flow. You source the companies that you're interested in. Um, yeah. Cool. And uh, what does Dorm Room Fund look for in student founders? Like, how do you evaluate them? Uh, what are you indexing mm -hmm. on? Because of student founders and a lot of them don't necessarily have previous experience, uh, it's just general track record of like hustle and uh, we're often looking for founder market fit. And so if someone has a, is building in construction management, like AI for construction management, um, if they already have an in non-construction management, maybe if they're working there for, but generally probably the number one thing we look for is just really strong founding teams and an alignment between founding team and what they're building in and just like a really good understanding of who they're building for and being like very obsessed with those that part of the market and is everyone looking for like the same thing or do student uh investment partners sort of have like the autonomy to make their own thesis of like what they're looking for in in founders they're working with yeah so we do work as a unified team and so there are definitely a lot of markers of good companies that we all look for um and those are all things we talk about within our investment committee but in terms of companies that we individually source and companies that we find compelling towards us, everyone's feel is free to have their own investment theses. Um, some people are super well versed in e-commerce and they have thesis on it. And so they try to go find more companies that fit that thesis. Uh, but I think generally everyone's pretty aligned on like really wanting good, strong founding teams with really good hustle. Cool. So it seems like there's a decent amount of collaboration between you and uh investment partners at other campuses. Can you talk more about like the internal team and how you work with them 
So I think there's like three members of the full-time investment team, Molly and a couple of other people. Um, like how do you work with them or how do you engage with them? Yeah. So we work for the most part within our regional investment teams. And so we have four. Philly and Southeast is the one that I'm on, which covers from Penn all the way down to Duke, Florida, um, that whole region. And so within this team, everyone is autonomous and everyone has the same vote when it comes to investment committee decisions. Uh, Molly Fowler is our GP. And so she's the one who runs the fund. She's the one who represents the fund. And so once we make investment decisions, essentially we tell Molly like, hey, this passed, kind of moving on to the negotiation stage, the term sheet stage, or hey, this didn't pass. We're looking for our next in our funnel. Um, in terms of working with people on our own team, uh, it's very, there's a lot of camaraderie. And so you kind of just text them being like, hey, like, I think this company is cool. Can you take a look at it too? Or you just text them yeah. because they're also your friends. In terms of interfacing with Molly, um, she's like outside of professional context, she is a great go-to for a lot of different things like advice, but uh, she helps us with diligence calls. She helps us with organizing everything. She helps us with events and streamlining all the different like criteria as well as uh, mandates for our investment process. Cool. So it sounds like uh, each student investment partner has the autonomy to actually like make the decision of like they want to invest in this company. Um, do you guys also do like the uh, like term negotiation and like all the logistics side of things too? Or um, I guess like how does an investment get done at Dorm Room Fund? Yeah. So eventual term sheet negotiation is with our GP Molly, but hmm. we do have pretty standard terms so going into uh investment pitch most of the founders are already aware of our usual terms which is 40k check for 1.3 yeah. percent ownership and so we make that very clear from the get-go um there will be some companies that are raising at like a 20 million post valuation cap that sometimes we're just not you know they're not a great fit for us or we're not a great fit for them uh yeah but yeah the eventual negotiation is with molly and the founders the investment process uh in terms of the pitch itself is all the, everyone on the investing team, the like one of the four voting on it. And so it just needs a majority of the votes to be yes for investment to pass. Um, and that's kind of after the founder's pitch, after we deliberate it, and after we think about like, is this fit for us? Are we fit for them? Cool. And is there like a cap on how many investments you can make at a certain school or a certain region? Or is it like, if you see a good student founder, you guys can move on it? We don't have a quota on anything. Um, it's definitely more so based on just quality. Like sometimes, uh, we won't invest in I don't know, a company for a month, two months straight, simply because we just, we didn't feel like it was the uh, right one for us. And so, yeah. no, there is no hard quota, but we do have a set amount of checks per year. Um, mm -hmm. each team gets a set amount of checks per year, and so if we use all that money up, we use all that money up. So yeah. Yeah. Um. Have you made uh, like a number of investments on Duke's campus or helped with a, a number of deals? Um, can you maybe talk about like one or two of those startups that uh, you invested in? Recently, we haven't made any investments in Duke startups, at least the time that I've been here. I have brought in a few companies from Duke to pitch to us that I had a lot of conviction in and I really liked founding teams, but unfortunately, uh, we didn't end up investing. And so mm -hmm. in terms of like recent companies we've invested in, uh there are a few of them that are still in stealth but i believe one that's come out of stealth is it's called peach it's a essentially like a financial planning startup sort of ish that also it essentially wants to be able to recalculate the apr on your loan automatically and be a financial planning as well as like credit building tool for people transitioning as like a 25 year old like younger people transitioning into the super prime uh but yeah. yeah. Cool. Uh, can you maybe talk about one of those companies that you brought to pitch that didn't make it through uh, the voting process or didn't actually get investment and asking the question more so from like the advice standpoint. So if like a founder, like why did you initially get uh, excited about that company? And I guess like where was the pushback on that, on that deal? Um, yeah. I don't think I can talk too much about the company specifically, but I can talk more about general yeah. frameworks of why some companies yeah. don't pass. Um, just because some of these most of these companies still are in stealth. Uh and so mm -hmm. there will be a few reasons why some companies don't pass pass. Um 
oftentimes those are usually we're usually focused a lot on market and product differentiation we're not necessarily the product itself but like the the road towards differentiation and so i think in general it's it's we we put a big bet on the founder and we hope that the founder is very dedicated and we really want to bet the founder but by the time they get to pitch usually we've already vetted all the founders and we think they're super impressive so a lot of the questions come down to do we think they actually have a good market strategy and do we think that like it's too long of a good market strategy or the sales cycle is too difficult it's just too many barriers to entry do we have conviction in them actually being able to have paid users and you know paid contracts etc or is this just like yeah like everyone will use it but no one's going to pay for it in that case it's a really really great project but sometimes it's hard to be a venture scale venture backable company um and sometimes we want to invest if we think like yeah what they're building super cool however it's just really hard to differentiate across a very saturated market maybe the competition is really strong um maybe the product may be very easy to build because the mode isn't as strong so gotcha and then uh i was looking through uh just like investment partners with LinkedIn and some of them said like managing partner and some of them said investment partner. Is there like any difference between the titles? Uh, like, can you move up in dormant fund or how does that work? Mm -hmm. Hierarchically, there's not too much of a structure. And so thankfully all, everyone's votes are all the same. No one has more essentially like influence during investment committee meetings. Uh, the managing partner yeah. essentially, we have around two per team per year. Those are people who act as liaison between the investment team as well as our GP. And so they have, I think, I can't remember if it's weekly or biweekly um, meetings that sync across all the managing partners, across all the teams to kind of get on the same page of like, what are each of our respective teams doing? Um, how's deal flow going? Is there anything we need help with? Generally the direction of DRF and interfacing like all those updates with Molly. Uh, yeah. They also help set the tone for general structure of things like running the meetings, uh, logistics stuff. So a lot of managing like the day-to-day -day internal stuff, but just like us, they're also just normal investment partners. They also do their own deal flow and we do our own deal flow. So in terms of investment decisions, not much of a difference, but like more managerial leadership things, they kind of like take an upper hand. Cool. And then uh, earlier in the conversation, when you were talking about like what you guys were looking for, it sounds like you need some like VC exposure or you need to be interested in like building startups. Um, I saw you did like an internship at a VC firm before you ended up uh, joining dorm room fund. Is that kind of correct in my assumption that like you need some sort of like, just like basic understanding of VC before you apply uh, to be a student partner at uh, dorm room fund? I wouldn't say it's a prerequisite, but traditionally most of the people who join dorm room fund are really interested in VC or really interested in startup building and want to have a career in something related to entrepreneurship in general. Uh, so it is very helpful to have at least some sort of background in it. And, you know, with experience comes an understanding of an industry and understanding of, you know, how you build your VCs. And so it always helps to have already built something or have already done an internship in VC. People are accepted from all different kinds of backgrounds though. Um, so it's never like a, you have to have done this before, but, it informs like the way you think about stuff and your decision making process. Cool. And then uh, last two questions are really just like advice related. Uh, the first one is like, what advice would you give to a founder applying for investment from a uh, dorm room fund? I think my biggest piece of advice and not so much for applying to DRF, but just like founding in general is to like really ask yourself like why you're building this and who you're building it for. Um, sometimes founders have a product, but it's not built for anyone specific or not built for a specific market. And so sometimes it can be hard to be product first and market second. Uh, and I think when you think really about like who you're building for and why you're building for, as well as like what niche you would try to enter a market for market, like through, um, it really helps the way you convey your story and the way you present yourself during a pitch, which translates on the investor side our conviction in the market and our conviction in how the founders like their vision their five-year 10-year vision uh yeah and i think as long as you really really understand your customer segment that always really helps cool and then the second piece of advice is like what advice would you give to a student uh preparing to apply to dorm room fund like how do they stand out 
I think it helps to really leverage your experiences. Um, no matter like what you've done before, it could be like you could have done ecosystem building, you could have like started a big organization, you could have done nonprofits, build a startup, VC, it doesn't really matter. But really leverage your experiences and have you like you can really spin the way you think about investing, the way you think about building in general through lived experiences. And I feel like having concrete examples always really helps your case. Um, sometimes it's a bit harder to say like, oh, I've researched a little bit, so I think this, but knowing your stuff through experience always, I think is easy. it's more easy to back up like all your frameworks. Nice, I really, uh, really like that advice. So then uh, last question is like, is there anything I didn't ask about that you think is important to know uh, for people considering dorm room fund as an investment partner or considering dorm room fund as a founder uh, looking for for investment i think i think people need to realize that like student investing um you know when you're like a 20 year old 21 year old or like 23 in grad school or something is very much a two-way street and so you can't really go into VC being like oh i just want to be really really good at it and do really good returns um that doesn't really happen unless you're also willing to put time into people who are in your portfolio and like really support the founders that you've interacted with, even if they don't end up, you know, joining, for instance, former fund or joining another VC's portfolio. And so whether that be like yeah. checking in on them, trying to provide them resources or connecting to the right people, uh, everything in this world is kind of a two-way street. And so if you're only in it for a very specific, like personal goal, it doesn't really end up working out. And you kind of have to think about the large picture of where you fit in and where you can help other people as well. Sweet. Sorry, that made me think of one more question. Can you talk more about uh, uh, just like after you've invested in a company, like what is dorm room funds sort of like value add to the founders? Like how do they work with them? Uh, yeah. Uh, so part of it is network and, and how we introduce our portfolio founders to other people within our portfolio saying like, if you build or if you're building in the mental health space, um, like, you know, uh, health tech space, we have XYZ companies in our portfolio who are doing this, connecting you guys, or like we have so-and-so in our network who's doing this, they can help you with this thing. And so I think the big part of any VC and the reason why people go for VC funding in general is having a automatically larger community. Um, another big thing is we help a lot with like fundraising. And so because we have our own LPs now and because a lot of dormer fund partners like alumni partners end up becoming VCs in their own rights um, and are now partners at these like massive firms. Uh, we really, really help with fundraising and closing rounds and that kind of stuff. And probably the last thing is just like peer to peer advice uh, because the partners are students, because they're of very similar experience levels or, you know, age ranges, we are able to help a lot more with like founder mental health and like talking to you about very nitpicky random things that you wouldn't maybe ask your lead investor about. Uh, things that can be like, hey, like, do I even get an attorney for this or not? And who should I talk to? And these are questions sometimes people not, might not think about asking a VC for, but we always try to help with. Great. Well, that was all the questions I had. Uh, thanks again, Chris, for uh, joining me today. Yeah, of course.